Hey, welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name is Richard, and this is episode 11, coming up next. All right, we've got some controversy, fun, exciting controversy, because uh, we all love controversy and little tidbits of juicy gossip or whatever. Or as our friends in England say, controversy. You've got to say it with a British accent, controversy. Ed Litton, the new president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and J.D. Greer have some connections. Now, this is not new news. I'm a little late to the game, and that's okay. I'm usually late to the game because I like to let things settle a little bit, and uh, I'm also really busy. And so, yeah. But I'm back with this Contra Talk, uh, or Contra Thoughts. Contra Talk's the other thing. And that's the interview show. Go ahead and check that out. I'll link it at the description where I interview different people. We've got some more of those coming up. Anyway, a uh, little plug. <clears throat> Point. No. So I'm in the Southern Baptist Convention. I went to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, no, I'm not woke. Don't worry. And I also pastor a Southern Baptist church, a small Southern Baptist church here in Kentucky. And so I'm in. I've got skin in the game. Uh, now, I care, and I've, I've liked J.D. Greer, although I've, his uh, appreciation from me has been waning quite a bit. And I didn't know about Ed Litton at all. I read some article a number of months ago about him and saying something about questioning why the Baptist network even existed, the conservative Baptist network even existed, which was formed after Resolution 9 was passed in 2019 about critical race theory and intersectionality and being in analytical tools, which they're not, by the way. But um, he was like, well, I don't know why they exist. I mean, everybody's conservative. Everybody believes in the inerrancy of scripture and so on. I don't know a pastor or a professor. I think it might have been with Baptist Press or somebody like that. Maybe Christianity Today. I can't remember. Maybe I'll find the article. Nevertheless, uh, that's not the issue. Now, he's been interviewed since, but the issue is sufficiency. Is the Bible sufficient? Now, this controversy... Uh, is not about sufficiency or inerrancy or infallibility of the scripture, uh, for which I wholly believe that that is the only way to approach scripture. But the con controversy is about sermon borrowing, plagiarism, uh, theft, whatever you want to call it. Um, let's go ahead and I'll pl play this, and we'll just look at J.D. Greer, who preached the sermon on Romans, uh, and then Ed Litton, who they he did apologize. He did apologize recently, uh, within, I don't know, the end, maybe the end of June, after all of this coming out. But did he say that beforehand? Did he say, hey, I'm not qualified, um, nothing. But let's just go ahead and watch this. We'll give you a warning here that this might be the toughest week that we will have in the book of Romans. Romans 1, the end of it is tied in difficulty only with Romans 5, Romans 9, and Romans 11. This may be one of the toughest passages we face in the book of Romans. This is the steep climb I talked about. So in fact, let's just sort of loosen things up right now. Everybody turn right now to your neighbor. Look him in the eyes. If you know them, if you know them, put your hand on their shoulder and say, this is going to be a really tough week for you, okay? And tell them, say, I'm praying for you to have the faith and humility to receive this word. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now. And I want you to say, I know this sermon is going to be really tough for you, but I'm here praying that you will listen and obey whatever God says. Go ahead, do that right now. But y'all, we believe that God's word is good, do we not? You see, we believe that God's word is good. In some of my travels overseas, I'll, I'll go into these temples that are erected to a foreign god. I remember being in one of them um, a while ago over in uh, somewhere um, uh, in Asia. And Paul David Tripp is a favorite pastor of mine to read. He's a pastor in Philadelphia. Uh, he was on a mission trip to Nepal. And he went, he was taken by a missionary into a temple. And there was, I uh, go into this temple, it's this gigantic, I mean, beautiful temple. And right in the middle of it is a, about a 25 foot statue of a, a goddess who has multiple breasts and, and multiple arms. And, and he said, and I, I will not go into details, but he does explain it. Uh, that there was an idol in the center of this temple. He said it was one of the most grotesque things he's ever seen. Watch these worshipers come in and they would prostrate themselves before this statue. And many of them were very emotional. Many had traveled a lot of miles to get uh, to this. Um, very poor, some of them, and taking the little money they had and pouring it out and offering before this statue of this God. And what really turned his stomach wasn't the shape of the idol. It was how people were bowing down to it, kissing it, putting money on it. He met a family that had walked for four months to get to this idol. Later, finding myself just going back over that incident in my mind and, and feeling sorry for the people there and thanking God kind of in my heart that I wasn't I wasn't like them but he walked out of that temple saying thank God I'm not like them then in the middle of that thought it just occurred to me I had a whole list of things in my heart that have taken God's place just like that statue had when the spirit of God said Paul you are exactly like them I, I compared it to if the earth were to say to the sun I am sick and tired of you being in the middle of the solar system if the earth were to ask the sun in our solar system I'm sick and tired of floating out here in nothingness 
surrounding you constantly. I want to be the center of this solar system. The sun might just say to the earth, all right, have it your way. The earth is 30,000 times smaller than the sun and would not have the ability to keep all the planets in orbit. And so the solar system would begin to unravel simply because the sun gave to the earth what it asked for. Folks, our entire solar system would fall apart. Why? Because the earth doesn't have the power of light and it doesn't have the power of gravitational force to hold this solar system in existence. Oh, sexual disorder. That was the first thing, verses 26 and 27. Now we've got economic disorder. There's economic disorder. Look at verse 29. Uh, social disorder. He says there's social disorder. Social disorder. Just think Facebook. Uh, that's just on Facebook. Uh, then you got spiritual disorder. There's spiritual disorder there. You could think of that as family disorder. You, and there's family disorder. They disobey their parents. You see, there are three ways I see us really going wrong with this in the church at large. Three, I'll tell you three ways I think we've gone wrong. Number one, number one, we believe that God doesn't really care about this. First one is that we don't think God cares about this issue. We make the gospel message is not let the gay become straight. The gospel message is let the dead become alive. And the gospel message is not let the gay get straight. The gospel message is let the dead come to life. Which leads me to the second way that I see us going wrong here. Number two, we think it's the worst sin. Here's the second thing I think we do, we go wrong, and that is thinking homosexuality is the worst of all sins. Jen Wilkin, who's one of our favorite Bible teachers here and who's actually leading our women's conference, she said, she said we ought to whisper about what the Bible whispers about, and we ought to shout about what it shouts about. And the Bible appears more to whisper when it comes to sexual sin compared to its shouts about materialism and religious pride. In the Bible, the sexual sin is whispered compared to the shout God makes about greed and judgmentalism. Throughout Jesus' ministry in his life, we see him demonstrating great, just incredible sympathy for those caught in sexual sin and great animosity toward the religiously proud. Jesus forgave prostitutes, but he was harsh with religious materialists. In fact, Jesus one time, not one time, ever said that it was difficult for the same sex attracted to go to heaven. He did say it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, eye of a needle, than it was for a religiously proud or materialistically successful person to enter into the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, he said it would be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one of these. Only when we grasp, only when we grasp this truth will we become ministers of the gospel. When we understand, like Paul did, that we are the worst sinner that we know. Only then, when you, only when you understand that, will you understand that if Jesus came to die for you, that there's nobody he didn't die for. We can't grasp this gospel till we confess with Paul these words. In 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, this is a trustworthy saying, deserving full acceptance, that Christ has come into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Here's the third way that we go wrong. Number three, assuming it's hard for LGBTQ people to get to heaven. Thirdly, we go wrong thinking LGBT people can't go to heaven. Homosexuality does not send you to hell. You know how I know that? Because heterosexuality does not send you to heaven. Homosexuality does not send people to hell. How do I know that? Because heterosexuality doesn't send people to heaven. Rosaria Butterfield, whose story I've shared with you before here, she was a practicing lesbian, very outspoken, professor of literature and women's studies at Syracuse University. She was a practicing lesbian in a committed lesbian relationship, a culture warrior on the far left. She said it was Romans 1 that brought her to faith in Christ. And then she said, and I quote, homosexuality is not the core of our rebellion against God. I desire to be God is. A desire to be the one who gets to declare good and evil, to play judge rather than be judged. A desire to use God's creation for our own gratification rather than with pleasure. So we've got Ed Litton who's preaching. Uh, he's a pastor and J.D. Greer is a pastor. Uh, both good-sized churches. I think uh, the Summit Church there is a bigger church, but that's irrelevant. And they're preaching through Romans. And this is a good sermon to preach through, a good book to preach through, right? Um, but the problem is Ed Litton is basically stealing He's plagiarizing J.D. Greer. Now, if I've done that, or if I were to do that, or if someone else were to do that, then they would be called out if they were found out, and they rightfully so, rightfully so. Um, Ed Litton here, he's in an article, there's Christian Post, it says, this is one of the things he talks about, uh, where he apologizes, and then the whispering, that's already a controversy in and of itself. The Bible whispers about sexual sin. It doesn't. What are you even talking about whispering? You're just trying to like couch other things. Yes, arrogance and pride is the chief sin. So whether it's sexual sin is derived from pride, right? Theft is derived from pride. Lying is derived from pride. Pride really is the chief sin. Uh, because you think you're better than God, you think you're smarter than God, you think you deserve more than God has given you, uh, you deserve a better woman than God has provided, or you deserve a woman when you don't have a wife yet or a husband yet, uh, you deserve a better job, more money, so you steal, you deserve something different, so you lie, on and on and on, right? We, we deserve a better God, so we have idolatry. Uh, pride is the chief sin. So to say the Bible's whispering about homosexuality or uh, same-sex attraction or uh, any other form of aberrant sexuality, it doesn't really matter. 
because it's all pride and arrogance anyway. But uh, J.D. Greer is the outgoing president. Lytton is the incoming president. But the problem is not only that they're plagiarism, and now, oh, I apologize. Yeah, I should have given credit. Uh, my bad. That's my bad. Like, it's not like he said a quote, okay? It's not like he said, you know, maybe even a phrase or he used his outline and somebody found it out. But there is like 120 or 130 sermons now missing, privatized, and so on from Lytton's church's website. That's a little unusual. Uh, not to mention the fact that his church's website also changed. There was somebody who went to the convention and asked Dr. Moeller of Southern Seminary about Southern Seminary's beliefs, where Lytton got his Doctor of Ministry degree, if what they what Southern was teaching about the Trinity, Trinity and Trinitarian belief, uh, because Lytton, up until that point, <laughs> had an aberrant view of the Trinity, which is kind of a big deal as well for a Baptist evangelical pastor church and so on. And of course, that was changed just a few hours after that guy asked on the floor about the teaching at Southern Seminary that Ed Litton says, hey, this is what's going on. It was like a partial, it's called partialism. I won't really get into it. Anyway, the whole point is that Ed Litton is full of controversy already. He's been president technically two days. Today's July 2nd. That's a huge deal. Furthermore, uh, he says that he should have Given permit, uh, given um, credit, right? I love this quote here from ChristianPost.com. We employ, oh, hold on, let me back up. Like thousands of other Southern Baptist pastors, I labor each week preparing to stand in front of the congregation God has called me to serve. Yeah, okay. In preparation of our series on Romans, I use several resources to help me think through the structure, the series on how best to communicate the profound truths we encounter in these pages, Lytton said. Okay, yeah, that's all. I, I agree with all that. That sounds good. And then he says, now keep in mind, just like thousands of other Southern Baptist pastors, we employ a preaching team approach at Redemption Church that the comprised of eight men from our staff congregation who meet weekly, not to mention his wife, who also co-preaches with him sometimes, which is another controversy, but, you know, uh, I'm not even talking about that. This guy's just full of it uh, and and I, I want to be charitable, but like, if somebody has this much problem, I mean, would you vote for this guy for office if he has this much controversy, right? If you even for mayor uh, running your business, would you want him to be your boss, let alone your convention president that's 45 or 50,000 churches, whatever it is? Come on, guys. I mean, stop being a squishy, mushy middle of, of kind of this Big Eva sort of, I want to be good with Big Eva. Not like I want to be bad with bad, Big Eva, <laughs> but I don't. I want to call it where it is. the The Lord is our Lord, right? And we have to call the spade the spade. We have to walk in truth, in love. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be rude. But this is serious, especially when they said at the convention, which I was there, right? I heard this multiple times. The world's watching. The world's watching. Okay, yeah, the world's watching, so we should be biblical. We should be Christ followers. Forget what the world says. Forget what this group or these people or those people yelling over there say. We should say we should be faithful because Jesus is watching. The world's watching, yes, but really, God's watching. Jesus is watching. The Spirit is watching. But then in this, below this, he says, preaching team, back to the article, Redemption Church is comprised of eight men from the staff congregation who meet weekly to discuss insights, outlines, approaches to the text. The sermon prep process includes working in the languages, and he goes on and on and on. And then he says, in that process, I learned about my friend J.D. Greer's message on Romans and discovered what he had recently preached. Resonated with the direction God was leading the men to preaching team. Okay, so first of all, I don't have a preaching team, and about all the other thousands of pastors don't either. Okay, uh, my pastor, my former pastor when I was in seminary, church of about 700, I don't think he has a preaching team. And he's he works at the seminary. Like he's he's legit. He's got his doctorate. He doesn't have a preaching team. He might have, you know, one or two guys help him. He doesn't have eight guys forming his sermon. That's ridiculous. And so for Lytton alone to be like, oh hey, I'm just like you guys. I mean, you guys have, you know, almost a baseball team's worth of men making your sermon, right? And you just kind of piecemeal it together and deliver it. Right? Well, Richard doesn't. And I know several other pastors in my area that have none of that. The point here is that Lytton is acting like, oh, I'm just like everybody else. And, oh, yeah, somebody brought up J.D. Greer's sermon on Romans 1. And, you know, I happen to just, you know, use it. Now, 
Why wouldn't you say that? It's not like he was delivered a message or here's, hey, Mr. Litton, Pastor Litton, Dr. Litton, here's your uh, sermon for the week. Go ahead and preach it. Have a nice day. Can't wait. Oh, great. Thanks so much. And he goes over it. Maybe he adds a few things in there. And that's it. And if he said that, that would be different. But he's not saying that. He's just saying, ah, I should have given him credit. But you knew it was his to begin with. So even if you somehow misspoke or misstepped or whatever you want to call it, that's still a massive problem. Because forget, you know, your wife helping you preach, quote unquote, um, and being up on stage and literally helping him preach and actually preaching, which is against the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, the document for the Southern Baptist Convention, as well as just against Titus and Timothy and Corinthians and a bunch of other biblical pastors, you know, whatever, who give it, you know, forget about that. Um, <laughs> and forget about the 120 sermons missing and forget about the fact that he has a Trinitarian belief that's aberrant or was aberrant or his church, which is a doctrinal statement. It's not like it's some blog post or some off the cuff tweet that was misunderstood. This is a doctrinal statement. We just met this last week talking about our church covenant and it's already written and it took two and a half hours for us just to go through the changes. Okay. And it was 10 of us or so, 12 of us, however many was here saying, Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to change this. What about this? What about this? These fine little details going through a fine tooth comb. Having something about the Trinity that's not quite right is kind of a big deal. You shouldn't have a good Trinitarian belief statement. Maybe like we're not Unitarians. We're Trinitarians. God is Father, Son, and Spirit. <sighs> anyway, so the message here is simple. Plagiarism is wrong, right? And if a fifth grader stole from a previous fifth grader's paper, like his older brother in you know English class, they would be found out. He would probably be written up, maybe even suspended or kicked out of class entirely. Although maybe not these days with the squishy, terrible school systems that seem to dominate the land. But if it were a normal school system, <laughs> if it were a, a class or a place that cared about um, ethics and morality and, and accountability and everything else, then saying, you can't plagiarize. This is wrong. He does say with his permission in this article, I borrowed some of the insights and in those three closing points, Litton wrote. But he doesn't just, bar he's starting the sermon and saying, hey, this is what, it, at least that's what this clip looks like it's the start of a sermon and so he's not just borrowing he's like he's literally stealing the language it's word for word or like 95 percent close word for word so that's again it's a huge deal and quite frankly Lytton should step down i really i really think i mean i know some who think oh you know he's a he's a good bridge builder and not building walls and so on and he's got a lot of racial reconciliation and he's a pastor in alabama and he's got a lot there's a lot of hurt and history and you know we need to continue to heal southern baptists and slavery and segregation and all the stuff that is real stuff so that's why a lot of people voted for him thinking oh he, you know he's kind of this middle road guy a lot of people call him the wokest candidate or the most progressive candidate which i mean he more or less is compared to moeller or um stone or Adams, the three other candidates. But I'm not encouraged at all <laughs> by how a lot of the denomination uh, hashed out on those two days in early June because there was so much division of how people voted. Basically, we, we vote with these little things we hold up. Mine's just hanging over there. I'd grab it, but that would be awkward. Uh, here, I'll just get it. This thing. So, we go like this. Ah, I want to vote for that. Anyway, it's fun. That's bright yellow. Um, and then there's little ballots. If you want to do, you have to write something uh, and mark, you know, one for this, three for this, five for this, and so on. Anyway, not like you really asked or really care. But the point is that there is four. there were four different presidents, and this was the biggest convention uh, in a really long time, in like 20-some-odd years, 25 years. And uh, that shows that there is much at foot. Now, sadly, with the 45 to 50,000 churches, whatever the actual number is, and hundreds and hundreds of people in each of those churches, sometimes thousands, the convention has millions of people, supposedly. And therefore, only 15,000 were there, 16,000 were there. So out of millions, there's only 16,000 represented. And this, again, just looks just like the United States in a lot of ways. Where we have, you know, 300 million people, 350 million people, this many people can vote, and only this many people actually voted. Uh, dead or alive, they voted. But this has been a troubling uh, endeavor, a troubling statement from Greer and specifically Lytton. Uh, again, he apologizes. I'll link the actual 
ChristianPost.com article. I'm not trying to slander him. I'm not trying to say any such thing. Uh, he did apologize, like I said, but he already knew this from the beginning. And where are these 120, 130 other sermons? Are those also plagiarized? Uh, if they are, then we have a serious problem. And if you've done this one time, there's a good chance you've probably done it more than once. Kind of like the whole Bill Clinton thing from the 90s, right? He got caught with Monica Lewinsky. And it's like, that wasn't Bill's first affair in the White House. It was just the one he got caught with. And, you know, whatever the percentages mathematically are, when you get caught with something, it's not the first time you've done it, right? You've done it multiple other times, generally, as the rule of thumb. I'm not saying uh, uh, Lytton has, but... Where are these other sermons? These 120, 130 other sermons. Why did they disappear? Why is your wife preaching? Why did you have a change of heart in your doctrinal statement whilst at the convention on Tuesday or Wednesday, I guess it was Wednesday, when Moeller was asked about the Southern Seminary's preaching and teaching on the Trinity? And since Lynn went there, it's like, hey, he's the new president. What does he believe about the Trinity? It's kind of a basic thing. And oh, miraculously, the website changes a few hours after that question was posed to Moeller. Interesting, he also mentions Tom Askell, who's a big proponent of the conservative Baptist network, which is basically the opposition of the wokeism and leftism that the convention seems to be wanting to go, at least the higher ups, not necessarily the churches, but many of the higher ups are. Uh, but he says, when Tom Askell and a few other same pastors seemingly looked to trap me in my words, first highlighted, highlighted these things two years ago, they never reached out to me for clarification. And clarification, I would be happy to supply. Some others did. And when I shared the fuller context of my words, most were satisfied, even if still preferred to avoid shout whisper analogy. I'm not going to read the whole article. The point is, you don't need to reach out to the guy. You're literally stealing from it. Now, if I missed part of that where you say, hey, I'm going to preach J.D. Greer's sermon. I've heard sermons where they've preached old sermons before. Say, uh, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God, for example. That's Jonathan Edwards' famous, famous, famous sermon. Uh, and I've heard guys preach that sermon. But everybody knows it's Jonathan Edwards. No one's like, man, Richard, that was a really good sermon. I can't believe you. Like, that was way different than you normally preach. It was kind of hard and harsh, and but really informative and very structured and Man, that was really good. Like, I would never do that as if it's my own sermon. But that apparently is now allowed uh, or something. So anyway, uh, I'll leave the comments and little whatever below. Uh, the, yeah, ChristianPost.com and a few other things. And um, go ahead and click like and subscribe if you do like this video. I'd appreciate it. Uh, it's good for the And um, am I supposed to say that? I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. But Comment below as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And uh, until next time, be against the world for the sake of the world. Take care.